for a long time, hockey stats were just goals, assists, penalties, and later time on ice and shots and stuff like that. But since then, we've learned that there's a lot more going on that we can understand about hockey if we're willing to go just a little bit deeper. The so-called advanced stats, and I don't really like that name because it's not very inclusive and it's not very accurate, tell us a lot more about the game. There's measurements of puck possession like Fenwick and Corsi. There's ways to weigh randomness and luck like PDO. And there's information about the context in which players are playing like quality of competition and zone starts. These stats give us more and better information about players and teams. They can confirm and challenge what our eyes tell us. They can tell us when a good player is getting a raw deal or when a mediocre team is overperforming and what coaches are doing really clever stuff. Let's start with a story. Imagine a player, let's call him Matt. Matt plays for the green team. His opponent is the pink team. Let's say during one game, Matt plays around 15 minutes of five-on-five -five play. Here's all the stuff that happened during that time. At left, we have Matt's team's shot attempts while Matt was on the ice. There are four shots on goal. The big one was a goal. There are two misses and two blocks. At right are the opponent's shot attempts while Matt was on the ice. There are two shots on goal. Both of them scored two misses and one block. So if we were to just count the goals, there'd be one for Matt's team and two for the other team when he was on the ice, and that's a minus one goal differential. And for no particular reason, here's a picture of Jeff Schultz. But if we count all the shot attempts while Matt was on the ice, we have a better understanding of where he spent his time and how he was doing. So when Matt was on the ice, his team had four shots, two misses, and two blocks. And the other team had two shots, two misses, and one block. That's eight shot attempts for the green team and five shot attempts for the pink team. Or we can just call that a plus three shot attempt differential. We can also express that as a percentage or a ratio or a fraction. So if Matt's team had eight shot attempts while he was on the ice out of a grand total of 13 shot attempts while he was on the ice, that gives his team 61.5% of the shot attempts or a 61.5% Corsi or Corsi 4 or CF or whatever you want to call it. That's all Corsi is. It's just counting up shot attempts while someone's on the ice. Fenwick is the same thing except you don't count blocks, and you can express it as a differential. Matt's team had three more shot attempts than the other team, or as a percentage. Matt's team had 61.5% of the total shot attempts. And there's a bunch of ways to say this. You can call it puck possession. You can call it tilting the ice. You can call it zone time. You can call it time on attack. But most people just call it Corsi. Now, that was just for one game. If you do this for a whole bunch of games, like a whole season, the data gets a whole lot more reliable. And you can do it for a single player, or you can do it for a whole team. All right, this next part's really important. A player's puck possession numbers are not necessarily the same thing as that player's talent. When we start to interpret a player's puck possession numbers, we have to take into account a bunch of different questions. How good are his teammates? How good are his opponents? Is he trying to protect the lead? Is he trying to come back? And where is he starting all of his shifts? When we start to answer those questions, we start to understand the context that informs the possession numbers. In that game we were talking about before, let's say that Matt started five shifts in the offensive zone and just two of them in the defensive zone. We'll ignore the neutral zone for right now. That gives him five offensive zone starts and two defensive zone starts, or a 71.4 offensive zone start percentage. Sometimes you'll just see that as ZS percentage. There's a bunch of different ways to interpret zone start percentage. You can say that a player that starts most of his shifts in the offensive zone is not trusted by his coach in his own end, or you could say that he's an optimized scorer. Zone starts give us a better understanding of how a player is used. A player who starts most of his shifts in the offensive zone closer to the opponent's net is more likely to be on the ice for shot attempts in his team's favor and therefore more likely to have a good possession score. All right, last one and then you can go. PDO doesn't stand for anything, but it helps us measure the randomness or luck of hockey. The average five on five shooting percentage in the NHL is around 7.7%. And obviously that means that the average save percentage must be around 92.3%. You add those numbers together and you get 100%. That's your average league PDO. But because goals are sort of rare events, those percentages jump all around inside small samples. And there's not a lot of evidence that players can control those variations. So if a player has a PDO above 100, they're getting sort of lucky. And if a player has a PDO below 100, they're getting unlucky. Imagine a player, let's call him Alex, and while he's on the ice during a whole season, his team gets 565 shots on goal. The other team gets 640 shots. If Alex's PDO were league average 100, we'd expect his team to be outshot 50 to 44 while he's on the ice during 5 on 5. But if Alex's team shot below average and saved below average, he would have a PDO of just 96.4 way less than league average, and that would result in him having an on-ice goal differential of negative 27. PDO helps us better understand the gap between possession measured in shot attempts and results measured in goals. Good players can often have really bad boxcar stats because their PDO is awful. 
And because PDO isn't something that players can generally control, stats like plus minus aren't really telling us what we thought they were. All right, a quick summary and then we're done. When we're talking about Corsi and Fenwick, we're really just talking about puck possession, which we measure in shot attempts. A Corsi above 50% just means a player or a team is out shooting its opponents. That's it. Of course, there's a whole bunch of assumptions baked into Corsi numbers, and exploring those assumptions is a huge part of analysis. Zone starts, for example, can help us understand if a player is starting near the opponent's net more than his own, which could color his possession. Now, PDO, that's the gap between possession and goals. A PDO above 100 means a player or a team is scoring more or getting scored on less, or both, than we'd expect based on league average. Once we have these basics down, there's a whole bunch of cool stuff we can do. We can measure Corsi just in situations when the score is close, so the effects of protecting a lead or mounting a comeback don't distort the data. We can compare Corsi when players are on the ice together versus when they're apart. That's called wowie or a with you without you analysis. We can compare a player's Corsi versus how his team does when he's off the ice. The difference between those two numbers is often called relative Corsi. And we can measure which players have tough competition or really good line mates based on the average Corsi numbers of that competition or those line mates. Now, I've done a lot of simplifying here, so I encourage you to do reading on your own, ask questions, and make your own discoveries. There's a lot of cool stuff to learn and lots of cool people to share it with. Please ask questions and comments or on Twitter. Please feel free to share this video wherever and whenever you want. Hockey is for everybody, and that goes for hockey stats as well. My name is Peter Hassan, and I'm from Russian Machine Never Breaks. If you like this video, please like it or subscribe or do both. That'd be even better. Thank you for watching, and crash the net.